Hey, good morning. Once again, we're coming to you from Oakwood University and discussing black psychological perspectives um, from Allison's and Belgrave's book, African American Psychology. Today we'll be talking about chapter seven and it's entitled Neighborhoods and Communities. Um, and so as we typically do, I'm gonna start with prayer, then we'll get into some of these pieces here. And uh, prayer is more for me, you know, so I'm not <laughs> saying anything that's against the truth or um, I'm making sure I'm including what I need to. Um, this is a part of a class that we have here on campus. And really the main reason I wanted to continue to bring this to you is that most people don't get exposure to this um, type of information. Um, so here goes. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity for us to be able to share ideas on black psychology. Please be with us now as we um, discuss and consider neighborhoods and communities. Thank you for your continued blessings. Amen. So it's early in the morning. Um, I, I have to book in my day with most of these kinds of things, especially if I'm doing a video. So um, I appreciate your indulgence. Um, but yeah, let's get right into it. So I usually start with vocabulary and let's get into some of those vocabulary pieces. So one of the words that I started with is Hispanic. Um, the book brings it up, but it's also one of those words where that was legally constructed in the 70s for the census, right? It kind of just combined a lot of people um, and America tends to do that sometimes where we just combine a lot of people into categories that may or may not fit. And for some people it fits nowadays and um, if you go on the West Coast, uh, it's very rare that I ran into a person who was really locked into that, particularly um, folks who I grew up with and I went to school with um, high school and college. Um, they would prefer or tend to at least identify more with Chicano or Mexican American rather than Hispanic because it just seemed to kind of lump them into this large group um, that they may or may not have identified with. So. But I, I think about the othering that happens with the United States government or you know American culture that may lead to a created term that was created during the Nixon administration. All right, next vocabulary word is community um, versus black community. And I often see people use this kind of interchangeably, almost like urban in referring to black people. Um, but I, I do think there is a black community. Um, so, and I'm gonna use my historically black college here, Oakwood University, um, as kind of a discussion point, right? So when I think of the Oakwood community, it's not just the students who go here, not that the faculty and staff, but it's also people who are alumni and who live locally or who have children who go here or who participate in that. So if I'm looking to do something with the Oakwood community, right? And so for example, I have a self-defense class that I'm fortunate enough to be able to teach here and people can participate if they're in the Oakwood community. I know them, they're connected to me, I'm connected to them in some way, largely through Oakwood. Um, and so, but that also has kind of its beginning and end, right? And, and there's been a lot of conversation, I think, on social media more recently about who's actually in the black community, if we're talking specifically the African-American community um, and, and the ADOS group, you know, American descendants of slavery, um, or we're thinking more broadly, right, of those including African immigrants, those including um, people who may have come from other parts of diaspora, specifically um, Afro-Latinos from the Dominican, from Venezuela, but now they're here in the United States and exploring or expressing their black identity, right? And as it comes to identity politics and other issues, right, we're really um, working together to try to figure that out in the United States of America. And I think our electoral politics are really kind of bent around this conversation about community versus black community um, and, and what that means. Um, so I, I don't want to spend too much more time on it, but I wanted to give you some thoughts about that because the book brings that up, right? Um, Geiman shaft, right? And I, and I may be saying this totally wrong because I don't speak German, <laughs> but 
um, at least how I read it, G-E-M-I-N-S-C-H-A-F-T, right? It has to do more with social ties and that, that community that one lives in. I'm speaking very generally about community and social ties. And Gesselschaft, G-E-S-E-L-L-S-C-H-A-F-T, this refers more to the resources that are within the society um, and, and I think about to either help communities or society as a whole, but the resources that are available. So our social ties and then our resources, Geiman Shaft, Gessel Shaft, right? And those two kind of go together when you see people writing about them, right? Neighborhood, right? And I want us to think about real critically about neighborhood, especially in the era of gentrification. Right. In, in, in some of the chapters, we talked about gentrification before, particularly on race and racism in chapter four. But this idea of who is my neighbor and what creates, you know, the definition of a neighbor and also the definition of a hood. Right. And, and, and coming from feudal systems, clans, groups, people who share similar affinities um, and they come together to help each other. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've always lived next to really good neighbors um, and tried to be one myself. So um, how we think about that in our own experience, but also how we think about that when we're um, deconstructing as well as constructing realities related to communities. Right? Communalism, we've talked about that before, particularly in the African context but also our African-American context and how that kind of ebbs and flows. Um, next, community psychology is a particular version of psychology um, that looks at community dynamics and how people make decisions within those community dynamics, how people are reinforced, how people grow and develop. Um, and finally, I added one other vocabulary word I think is important when we consider the people, right? and as in power to the people coming from the Black Panther Party um, phrase that was you know, adopted by many other groups, but who are the people that we fight for? Um, I'm very cognizant in my research and my, um, the way I deliver services as a psychologist um, and now as a higher ed administrator about the people and constantly want to keep them before me. Um, I, I think of Martin Luther King, if he's writing a speech, if he's getting ready to um, go represent the people, how is he doing that? There's one version, I, I think, of the people when we talk about the United States government, and then I think there's a um, version that at time was reactionary, but sometimes can be constructive and allowing us to build. But I think it's important to consider um, what our understanding is of the people when we read it in text, when we talk about it in political discourse, but also when we talk about it personally for people who um, work with others, right? So um, one example is more recently the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I had worked with a thesis student, his name is Taharka Anderson out of Cal State Long Beach, and he was looking at the um, toll um, that doing political activism may take on students and their sacrifice, get this, sacrifice for the people, right? Similarly to Dr. Huey P. Newton's um, dissertation on revolutionary suicide and his sacrifice and his interaction with the United States government and what he was trying to do to unite people around the world with his understanding of intercommunalism. All right, um, I hope those vocabulary words kind of set it off and I'll review them again, Hispanic, Community versus black community, Guyman Shaft and Gessel Shaft, neighborhood, communalism, community psychology, and the people as in power to the people. All right. So I'll provide some community capacity, uh, or at least this one example from Francois Overstreet and Cunningham with, with their 2012 study. They um, talked to um, two. 106 African-American students were asked to self-report, and these were in K through 12. Um, in neighborhoods where there were few opportunities for involvement and high exposure to community violence, students um, with high participation reported better academic performance, right? Um, so 
students with high participation in their communities, right? Um, and who would actively address some of these issues um, related to violence or other things, but they um, got involved either politically or socially, um, you know, at their local Boys and Girls Club and other things like that. In contrast, when neighborhoods were reported to have many opportunities for involvement, but students had high levels of community violence exposure, those who were made more actively engaged and participating reported lower grades, right? So, man, this idea of violence exposure, right? And, you know, really delving into responding to that, that may take up a lot of time. I think underneath this kind of study, they're talking about um, trauma, right? And if you have unresolved trauma, it makes it difficult for you to engage in your schoolwork or your academics. So, yeah. So if I'm less involved in a community, but yet there's high community violence, and I find my way to the school setting, right? I may have better academic performance, but if I have to get involved, that may impact my academic performance. Right. Um, I think about Chaka Khan, right? Um, and there was an interview um, this month because there is, she has a new album out. You know, Chaka Khan still putting out albums at 65, one of my favorite. Um, uh, just a little aside, that was the first tape I ever bought was uh, Chaka Khan. Um, in 1984, I think my 12th or 13th birthday, somewhere around there. Um, so, but this idea, um, right, students having access, right? And Chaka Khan was a teenager within the Black Panther Party, and she spent a lot of time trying to actually o overthrow, you know, the oppression that was going on around her from day to day but it didn't necessarily help her academics, right? Um, and, and she wasn't that concerned about that. And that, that, that's a whole other piece. We're gonna get into that in another chapter um, um, in just a couple of chapters from now, but we'll, we'll get into more of kind of how students perceive themselves and what they attribute their success to. But this is an interesting kind of study, at least for me, and, and trauma because I've worked in settings like that where um, students would see their friends killed through gun violence in the community or ongoing type of, you know, gang interaction or dealing with the police and it was, but there was a high exposure to violence. Um, and sometimes they could tend to really get hyper involved with um, community service um, activities or social justice activities and may have to put their schoolwork on the back burner. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just, I am interested in the phenomena. Um, another study, Bird and Chabos, found both neighborhood opportunity and ethnic pride to be positively associated with their GPA. And this was a 2009 study by Bird and Chabos. All right. So there's a historical perspective on community, right? If we think about West African communal ties and how, you know, um, particularly those of us in America, our communal ties were broken to West Africa, although we tried to hold on to things through our music, through our food, um, even through our version of the English language, right? Um, and we'll talk about Ebonics um, in another chapter, but definitely how we try to hold on to those, some of those things. Um, so the separations from blood kin supported the construction of social networks not bound by biological relationships, right? or even geographical relationships sometimes, like we were having to migrate and move from one setting to another. Um, therefore, black migration really started in the 1860s, continuing on through, you know, the 1940s and 60s, and, and, and then again in the 70s, and I think we're experiencing another huge migration um, with gentrification and, and more kind of a fractured migration, right? Um, but the requirements for us to need to expand and come together and expand and come together. So also since the 1980s and 2000s, more black people are moving from urban to suburban areas. And so African-American sense of social connection and community in urban neighborhoods has declined significantly. So 
Um, one of the things that I saw growing up in the 90s is that, um, and it really in the 80s as well, because um, I didn't grow up in the 90s. I was, I was a grown man in the 90s. But in the 80s, um, my parents would travel almost two hours um, once a month to make sure that my sister and I went all the way to the city um, to um, attend an African-American church. So we would have some of those ties to people that I that they grew up with, but also my aunts um, and uncles who lived nearby the church, but to make sure that we knew what a black church experience was like because there was none around, um, at least with our particular religious denomination. So this need for social connection and community in urban neighborhoods has declined significantly through the mid 20th century. So we also have concerns about you know, the rent being too high, um, mortgages not given, or you have adjustable rate mortgages that are leading to um, evictions. There's also been declines in neighborhood poverty um, during childhood, um, and this has led to a uh, higher um, average annual income, and you can predict that more, you know, if a child is growing up in poverty, they're more likely to kind of stay in poverty. Um, but, you know, as another study that we saw um, in the last um, video, um, 6 to 12, you know, that black boys, they're not necessarily guaranteed, even if their parents are millionaires, to um, be out of poverty. Um, there are many factors that may lead to living in poverty, All right? Finally, African-American, when it comes to this historical perspective and kind of moving up to today, African-American and other youth are at greater risk of exposure to airborne toxins, right? Um, depending on where you live and kind of the zoning laws and other pieces um, that have gone on. Um, a couple of places where I think of like St. Louis, um, but definitely even in Long Beach where I used to work in California, um, in the Bay Area, if you're by large ports, if you're by these areas where they're processing gases and chemicals um, and children are growing up in these areas, um, this has been a concern, and even the housing, right? Um, in the 70s and 80s, I remember you know, my parents telling me very directly about don't eat paint, <laughs> don't eat the window seals, because little kids were sometimes peeling paint and other things, and they were getting lead exposure and, and that type of thing, and, and it would lead to other problems, so. Shifting gears a bit, um, I, I put together kind of a little uh, picture montage, but I'll go through <laughs> some of these pictures. Um, and if you're still interested in the slides, I can send those to you. But you may recognize some of these shows that I'm about to talk about, um, which, and, and I have a friend, um, Dr. Michael J. Dumas, who teaches at UC Berkeley. He's taught at NYU, and we taught together for a bit at Cal State Long Beach. Um, he um, has a whole, um, class around 1970s um, black television shows related to education and how they talked about youth and young people. So Diane Carroll's show was about a um, t about a nurse um, in 1968 who was a single mother. Um, and if you look up Diane Carroll and her TV show, um, you'll be thoroughly impressed with the photos. She was a stunning woman. Um, good times in the 1970s, I'm sure folks are familiar with the memes, but may not be as familiar with how groundbreaking the show was. Um, and also the Jeffersons as well in the 1970s. And good times in the Jeffersons kind of juxtaposed to um, phenomena within black family life. One was, you know, living in a city in a housing project and another was living in a penthouse and, you know, becoming a small but um, prosperous business owner and, and moving up in the social strata um, and kind of the interactions and challenges that um, George Jefferson and his family faced um, and the two Lionels, if y'all remember that show. All right, the Cosby Show um, in the 1980s. Um, and there's not a lot that I, that I have to break, break down about that Cosby Show. Um, other than um, I think some of the more new developments and conversations that people are having is that, you know, they lived in a house that would have been priced at about $700,000 and even on their doctors and lawyers salary, uh, the two parents had, were doctors and lawyers, had five kids, um, they probably would not 
been able to afford the actual home that was shown um, in the regular TV show, right? Um, many other critiques and criticism about the Cosby, Cosby Show, and you can look those up, but I, I, I think um, what's important related to um, our conversation is that they showed um, an aspirational view of black life which it sent myself and many others, I think, on to historically black college because they had both gone to Hillman and met at Hillman, um, like my wife and I um, met at Oakwood, um, and you know, were living somewhat of a middle class life. But I could never afford that type of home. Um, but again, aspirational ideas, right? Um, rock um, in the nineteen nineties, um, the late eighties, nineteen nineties. Um, the rock television show, he was a sanitation worker or, you know, a garbage man, which I, I think is interesting juxtaposing Martin Luther King's last um, campaign was working with um, sanitation workers in the city of Memphis and, you know, the signs I, I think that are somewhat iconic about I am a man. Um, in the early 2000s, um, you had soul food um, uh, which was a show about a family that would come together to eat um, Sunday dinners each week, but also kind of address drama and other things. And there weren't a lot of drama shows for black folks. Um, most often we have a comedy, right? And most of these shows I'm listing are comedies. Um, there's only two shows that I'm thinking of um, that are, are not comedies. Um, Sister to Sister. Um, featured a blended family. Um, each parent had adopted um, twins, and then these two parents kind of came together. Um, they were single parents, but now they were co-parenting to raise these children. Interesting kind of dynamic. Um, in the 2010s, you have Queen Sugar, um, about a family that's coming back to their roots to some degree. Um, and blackish about a family exploring their roots and whether or not they really are black and connected to who they are. Um, each of these TV shows um, kind of also follow this path and trajectory um, that we're talking about and address some of these issues from time to time. And every once in a while you have, even in the comedy shows, you'd had a serious episode. Um, I, I always remember the one where George Jefferson got shot outside the laundromat that he owned. Um, and it kind of resonated with me because my granddad worked at a laundromat and owned a laundromat at least a couple times in his life. So, all right. Some theories, right, about neighborhoods and, and kind of different issues related to kind of this historical arc we talked about. So in Chicago, um, there's studies that looked at violence exposure um, can lead to higher asthma rates, right? Um, some other theories about broken windows, the more broken windows you have, the more people kind of uh, feel less invested in their neighborhoods and they're more likely to commit other crimes, which was the, um, what was that, Chief Bratton, who was both in New York and in LA. And that was kind of his approach to fighting crime, but it also led to, you know, um, doling out more kind of harsher um, policing towards um, petty crimes or people who have less money and less ability to even fight those so you're more likely to lock these folks up right um, so there's a give and take there um, you know and it eventually leads to you know the stop and frisk type policy um, because you don't want to let any minor thing go by right um, and I, I, I'm kind of frustrated to have to bring this up because this is not necessarily um, what we talk about when we talk about most Americans have to deal with, right? But these are some of these ideas and conversations that lead to consequences for the lives of black people, right? Social capital networks, um, Coleman and Putnam um, talk a bit about how people are connected and I'll break down a bit more of that later. I did my dissertation on social capital so I'll break that down a little bit more. Um, contagion and collective socialization um, and, you know, kind of this idea that 
being black sometimes can be a contagion to buying insurance, to buying a house, to buying a car, all right? And there's sometimes a black tax associated with that. And they even found um, in the 90s when I was a um, graduate student that, um, man, if you went to rent a car or buy insurance, um, people were keeping track of black people's accident rates and they were under the assumption that black people get in more accidents so they were less likely to either rent to you or give you insurance, right? And that you were contagion, right? Um, and you know, social competition, competition as well um, when it comes to resources, right? Um, going back to our Gessel shaft, right? So institutional resources and relationships um, and how people get access to you know, institutional resources um, leads to certain types of norms and you know how people feel collective um, efficacy in accessing those institutional resources. So let me, let me kind of break that down, right? Um, there's some kind of way people feel about um, working with a black institution. And I, I've kind of felt this before, we're like, man, it, we're always kind of competing for this or that, or you always have to bow down to this person or kiss that ring, or this is the only person in charge, this is the HNIC um, head, and I'm gonna keep it politically correct, head Negro in charge, and, and usually head Negro in charge refers back to kind of a plantation mentality, that one Negro was left to oversee, and that Negro was given special privileges over other black folk. Right, and you have to kind of work this norm, right? But there may be ways to change those norms to bring people together and how can we work effectively and collectively to solve problems, right? Um, some other issues have to do with poverty, uh, you know, and lack of work, and w which leads to higher stress. Um, and people in those situations, you know, government involvement occurs, but sometimes government involvement also comes with, you know, security and higher policing. So, you may you know, be a social worker or a psychologist working in a neighborhood and trying to uplift people who are under stress, but at the same time, some of the people who call themselves there to help may be providing more stress as well. Right. Um, externalizing behavior and internalizing if racism is experienced both in the neighborhood and outside the neighborhood, right? Um, and if you're externalizing the behavior, you know, you're you know, you're more prone to arguments and um, maybe even fights and that type of thing. And if you feel that there's nothing you can do about this racism, particularly, you know, in the North, um, that could lead to, you know, some broader challenges. Like, you know, in the 1990s, all through the late 80s, um, a prophet who I like to, at least prophetic in this sense, right? He was telling folks that a riot may occur, and that was um, the rapper, um, now movie producer and director Ice Cube, was telling people that you know something may happen. He was trying to give warnings, right? Um, but neighborhood cohesion could buffer the impacts of discrimination. So bringing people together can help um, diffuse some of that, but also bringing them together around a strong political end. Um, Social capital has been positively associated with positive parenting, which in turn was negatively related to um, children's adjustment, right? So if I'm in a social group that talks about parenting, right, um, and I'm able to gather other ideas about how to parent or other information on different resources, this can lead to better adjustment for children, right? Um, socialization emphasizing racial pride was also associated with perceptions of higher neighborhood social capital. Um, and I even perceive that I have more access um, if I have a sense of racial pride, right? Um, you know, and, and this is what happens sometimes you go to black church, you know, Dr. So-and-so is here with us today sitting in the pew, right? And that may be part of my neighborhood or part of my broader community. and. Uh, if I have a problem, I can go and talk to Dr. So-and-so, who is a lawyer and a medical doctor, and they go to my church. And they, because I sit in the same pew with them, I have some greater sense of connection um, than if 
Um, and particularly if they're emphasizing this during Black History Month, then if, you know, that's just some random person that I don't know. But m bringing that social cohesion together is important. Um, how we pose questions and understand or overstand, um, if I can borrow a term from the Rastas, um, family and neighborhood wellness must be questioned from a lens that provides a frame to best see the impact it has on all people and African Americans especially. So these are my last two slides here. Um, this next one has to do with evidence-based interventions and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the things that we missed. So these evidence-based interventions that the book brings up, um, door-to-door -door outreach is one of the first ones and strategies that started in Montgomery and other places in the South. And we're thinking about Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycotts and people just went door-to-door -to, -door to tell them about, you know, this is what's going on. Um, and they're not allowing people um, access um, to um, the schooling situation. Sorry about that. Yeah, the phone call. Um, programs to help with individual coping, such as emotional emancipation circles. The Association of Black Psychologists has worked with the emotional emancipation circles. Um, then the um, Harlem Children's Zone. Um, and New York has brought together a lot of, you know, money, like Bill Gates type money um, and some of his friends uh, with philanthropy to pose questions about what if we worked with children from, you know, birth all the way through, you know, and just past college and provide not just schooling support services, but um, parenting classes, karate classes, um, PSAT and SAT prep courses, ACT prep courses, um, and other type of enrichment, music and other things. Um, what could we do and what kinds of gains could we see? Um, that's run by um, Jeffrey Canada, or he's at least been the largest proponent of the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, nonprofits and foundations um, that sponsor um, reach-based programs, right? And there's programs that also offer like seed money or to help you know address a particular challenge in the community uh, we also have housing assistance for those familiar with section 8 um, former military vouchers as well and all of these have had um, there's been other programs that have impacts on reduction in obesity and depression and other challenges um, but i I think it's important to think about before we get started with an intervention or we lock into it, it's good to stay, particularly if you're a practicing psychologist, it's good to stay in connection with the programs that are within your community. And one of the first things to do, and I learned from my social work friends, is to go out and map the resources that are available to either the clients or the students or the community um, that I'm serving. So finally, as, as I wrap up a bit, um, I wanna do, um, talk about some of the things that were not said. So, and I talked, and I'll talk a, a bit about social capital and social capital networks that particularly support minority youth. So my dissertation chair, Ricardo Stanton Salazar, um, he looked at um, Latino youth and the types of networks that were made that went beyond the school sometimes or that were at the school. And that were not always the typical um, networks that led to students going to college, especially if they're forcing their family to go to college. I looked at you know African American um, social networks um, such as fraternities, churches, um, sororities, um, but I think there's also some of these networks are still around. Like when I go to speak on Black issues, I'll run into um, people who are in a part of the original Black Panther Party or people who are um, Pan Africanists or Black nationalists. And these are also social networks, if we think about like nationalist schools, um, where people share ideas as well as information to help children grow, right? Um, so there's social capital theorists who are, you know, black or Latino or addressing those issues or, or who looked at um, how black folks mobilize in Baltimore and other larger urban areas um, and cities. Um, Stan Salazar, I mentioned before, who looked at Latino youth, and um, I guess myself, I'm, I'm one of those few who's addressing black social capital. And I don't really address it from an aspirational lens, but I look at like, who do these people know? 
who do these people know and how do they use what they know to help them okay so the next question is what is the future of migration um, that black folks have had and continue to go through um, will we not be satisfied till we get a um, type of utopia or you know um, I, I guess the term now is maybe uh, living in a Wakanda state um, related to the Black Panther film. Um, another question is, where are black people doing well in their neighborhoods and how can they hold on to them, right? Um, if black people are doing well, it seems to be that they're being, the neighborhoods are being gentrified, rents are being raised, or property taxes are going higher and they may have to move out, or it just makes sense for them to sell, move to a cheaper location and buy two houses rather than one. Um, but that kind of diffuses the neighborhood. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'll leave it today. That phone call kind of threw me off. It's 7.30 in the morning around here, so folks are calling. Um, but I, I did want to at least share that with you, share that with our students. And if you, again, if you have any questions um, or if you're interested, you can definitely leave comments. But if you're interested in the notes, please email me specifically um, at bgamble at oakwood.edu. Um, hope you have a blessed day and thanks for watching.